you know, especially we we weren't we obviously I mean we had lost games before that, but um that game right there was kind of a little bit of a turning point in the season um last year. So just I mean just trying to learn as many lessons from that game as possible and I mean this it's a new year this year. Um you know, so we we just got to go ahead and just you know, watch the film from last year and watch their film from this year and just go out and give it our best shot. Just just go as hard as we can. Like Nebraska quarterback DiCaprio Boodle, who you just heard, I too haven't really been able to leave Nebraska's 34-7 loss to Minnesota last year behind yet. During this longest of long off seasons, it was the game I returned to most often. I was in Minneapolis for that one. I remember distinctly talking to some of my Hill varsity colleagues as we were waiting for post-game availability to start, that it felt like the worst loss to that point of, of the Scott Frost era. Why? We'll get into that and more as we look at this year's Huskers Gophers matchup. You're listening to the IED Preview Podcast. I'm Managing Editor Brandon Vogel. Let's talk some football. Let's get underway in the first half here as we do each week with a, a look at the spread. I was driving back from Purdue on Sunday when Circa Sports put out its opening line. And to, to be honest, my, my gut reaction was the line is too damn high. Circa, Circa made Nebraska a 10-point favorite um, on that opening line. Early betting on Sunday dropped it to Nebraska minus 9. But still at that point, I was thinking, that's that's a big number for two teams that are probably closer uh, in, in pure strength than, than a lot of people think. But as I thought about it more, I realized that the guys who know things, i.e. the bookmakers, might have a better sense of just what sort of uh, departures, attrition, missing players due to uh, a recent COVID outbreak at Minnesota, the Gophers might be dealing with. So factoring that in, yeah, it probably probably bumped it up a little bit. Um, we didn't even really know if the game was going to be played until Monday when Minnesota head coach PJ Fleck said that Minnesota had returned to, to full football practice on that Sunday. Um, and that the Gophers were going to do everything they could to play. So that was certainly welcome news. He also added that he was hopeful that they'd have most of their coaching staff available. The COVID outbreak that that paused Minnesota's season after the Purdue game on November 20th. So it's it's been a minute before the, the Gophers have been back in action. Um, it, it really impacted the staff. Fleck also noted that Minnesota might be pretty shorthanded from a player perspective, which at the end of this this strange football season, uh, what else can you expect? Nebraska's been pretty fortunate in that regard. With Flex acknowledgement that, yeah, this isn't necessarily going to be a, a full-strength Minnesota squad, the, the line had crept back up to 10.5 or Nebraska minus 11, depending on where you looked by midweek. So, it, Again, <laughs> everyone looks at these lines and thinks they have a, a, a better feel for it, but the public's been able to bet into this for, for a couple of days, and it's, it's hanging about right where it opened up at. So someday I'll learn that lesson. That line does, however, still feel as, as like a, a reflection of the circumstances as, as much as actual team strength, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So SP+, Plus, the ESPN power rating, that... We love on this podcast rates Nebraska 36th nationally up to a rating of 6.8, which is to say 6.8 points better than the average team, which is, a, I think, a point increase from from last week entering the Purdue game. So Nebraska got some decent credit for kind of handling its business on the road in West Lafayette. Minnesota checks in at 48th uh, with a rating of 5.2. So the SP plus projected line for this when you factor in two points for home field advantage would be about three and a half points. And that, and that feels a little bit closer to what I was expecting. FPI, just a quick check in on that ha has Nebraska 48th and Minnesota 59th, which would give you a four and a half point line. Either of those were kind of the range I was expecting here and, and maybe even a little higher uh, than I would have expected post Illinois. I mean, I think it's clear at this point with two games on from from that that 
Well, obviously, Illini was was certainly the low point of a season for Nebraska. I've been writing a feature this week with kind of a look back at what should we take from 2020 from a Nebraska football perspective. So if you're a Hale Varsity subscriber, you can look for that in the next print issue. Um, but it's it's kind of an interesting problem to untangle. And and really, you need this this last game, this last regular season game at least, to kind of complete the picture a little bit, I think. Identifying players to watch in this game, at least for, on the Minnesota side, it's going to be a little bit tricky just because of everything we just mentioned. We don't know exactly who is or or isn't available for this one, but in a a first for this podcast, which is you know, granted only eight games old at this point, um, I don't have any defensive players listed for Minnesota, which feels like sort of an accurate representation of where the Gophers find themselves this season. Uh, more on that later, but let's just jump in here with the guys who who probably will make a difference on on Saturday for for Minnesota. Number one, you can't really go anywhere else. It's running back Muhammad Ibrahim. He leads the Big Ten with 817 rushing yards and 13 rushing TDs. Those totals rank 17th and 6th nationally, despite Ibrahim playing just five games so far. The Gophers have leaned extraordinarily heavily on him this year. Um, And with Rashad Bateman out, star wide receiver who opted out back when it looked like the Big Ten wasn't going to play, then opted back in, then when the team paused activities a couple of weeks ago, decided, yeah, it's time for me to just get ready for the draft where he's a a potential first-round pick. Um, Without him, Ibrahim probably takes on even more of the focus. Though there is there is some help in the receiving front. Uh, wide receiver Chris Ottman Bell is my second player to watch. He'll take on a larger role without Bateman, most likely, but he's plenty good on his own. He had 112 yards receiving in the loss to Maryland in in the second week of Minnesota season, and then in the last game they played uh, again on November 20th, he went for 129 yards in the win over Purdue. So. He's dangerous. I think he averaged over 25 yards a catch against the Boilermakers. So got to keep an eye on him no matter where he's at. Third for the Gophers, uh, we'll go with, again, probably an expected pick, but it's quarterback Tanner Morgan. After a brilliant 2019 season that saw him throw 30 touchdowns to just seven interceptions, he's back to a one-to-one ratio uh, in terms of t- touchdowns to, to interceptions through five games. He failed to throw a touchdown in that game against Purdue for the first time in 18 games, but he's still plenty good. He's a good decision maker. Scott Frost had some pretty plain praise for him this week. And Minnesota's a dangerous offense, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about in the second half. For Nebraska, uh, it, it it is senior day on Saturday, whatever that means in a year where the eligibility clock is not running. Um, and, and most of the players this week said they don't know <laughs> what it means either, uh, for those guys that are being honored, um, uh, on Saturday as seniors, they could all come back if they want to. Most of them have said they haven't even really thought or talked, each, talked with each other about that. Um, so that'll, that'll be interesting going forward, not just for Nebraska, but for, for all teams, these, this, this off season that's coming up, um, teams are going to be kind of defined a little bit by, who does and who doesn't come back. And I don't think anybody would begrudge players for making the choice to, to not, you know, if you've, if you've got a red shirt year in there as part of your career, five, six years is a long time to be in college, even though for those of us who are, who are no longer in college, it sounds pretty great, but we'll stick with seniors for, for our three players to watch for the Huskers. Number one on my list is defensive lineman, Ben Stilley. He leads Nebraska's defensive line with three tackles for loss. Well, he and he and Damian Daniels are tied for the lead with with three apiece. Uh, so I gave the nod to the senior on that one. He's really the heart of a D line group that's been better than expected this year, and it's it's, it's a group that's going to be really important on Saturday as Nebraska is going to have to find a way to hold up against this Minnesota run game. Flip that almost directly around, uh, and number two for my Huskers to watch is running back Diedrich Mills. He had 16 carries against Purdue, which were his most since having 19, I believe, against Northwestern, and then missed a couple of games 
due to injury, but it was it was good for good for the Huskers to have him back. Obviously, I think it changes what they can can do from a play calling perspective to to a pretty decent degree. Uh, this would be a really good game for him to have a breakout, at least on a 2020 scale. Minnesota's defense ranks last in the Big Ten in yards per carry allowed, and its efficiency numbers are are even worse. So Nebraska's leaned on its quarterbacks a lot. I don't think this is the kind of game for that. Nebraska should be able to run the football against this defense, uh, but we just haven't seen a ton of it from, from Nebraska when it comes to handing the ball off. So Diedrich Mills, this is your day. Third for the Huskers, um, I'm going to go back to Will Honus, who, who's been featured uh, in this segment before in previous weeks. He only had four tackles against Purdue, but I think you can chalk a lot of that up to the fact that the Boilermakers threw the ball 47 times. They get the ball out pretty quick, though Nebraska's pass rush was, was surprisingly effective against Purdue last week. Um, Honus will have a bigger role Saturday with, with how much Minnesota wants to run the football. And I think as we get towards the end of this year, maybe his final year, maybe not, who knows, uh, Honus is really starting to emerge as that player. I think a lot of people thought they were getting as, as a junior college transfer had a injury right away when he got to Nebraska that, that cost him a year, but he's starting to look like, I think the immediate help they hoped they were getting. And, and that's why you go to the junior college ranks is, is for immediate help. Didn't quite work out that way, but he's approaching, I think, what they thought he could be. That'll take us to halftime, and as we do each week around here, here's meteorologist Rusty Dawkins with your weather forecast for Saturday. Uh, it's, it's December, so these things take on a little bit of extra importance, I think, each time out. Uh, you can follow Rusty at Husker Weather on Twitter or check the uh, Hale Varsity various social feeds and, of course, HaleVarsity.com for weekly updates from, from Rusty as we close out this 2020 regular season. Hi there, everyone. I'm meteorologist Rusty Dawkins with Hale Varsity for the I-80 Preview Podcast. We have a forecast that has a snow potential in it. Finally, something to talk about weather-wise uh, in the forecast for a Husker game. Minnesota's coming to town, so they're bringing winter with them. It's about time after a couple of days earlier uh, this week that had record high temperatures. December comes back with a vengeance. Now, snow is possible for the game on Saturday, but I think most of the snow will try to fall Friday into Friday night. Some of it will try to linger the first half of the day on Saturday, so we could see some snow at, at kickoff. Now, like I said, most of the snow wants to fall before that, but a low pressure system is going to push across the middle part of the country. The the middle of it will be just to our south. And this time of year, that means a pretty good chance for snowfall. Now, the timing uh, has the snow falling Friday to Friday night. And again, like I said earlier, some of that could linger into the first half of the day on Saturday. Now, along with this chance for snowfall, it's going to get colder. Uh, a very warm week leading up to, to this Husker game. Like I said, record high temperatures. It will be nowhere near that on Saturday. We'll see high temperatures that will struggle to get into the middle 30s. We're going to have a gusty north wind. That's at 10 to 20, maybe 30 miles per hour. That's going to blow around some of the snow that may have already fallen or continues to fall. So this is looking like winter has finally decided to show up in the capital city and just in time for a Husker game. Now, this is an evolving weather system, and we all know things can change. So if they do, we'll have updates for you as we go, get closer and closer to the game. Now, here's your hour-by-hour hour forecast. Kickoff, snow is possible. That's at 11 a.m. with temperatures just below the freezing mark and that north wind with a bite at 10 to 25 miles per hour. By halftime, snow still possible, but I think it should be ending as we head into the afternoon hours. Temperatures pretty close to that freezing mark and again the north wind kicking up at 10 to 25 miles per hour by the end of the game snow still possible but less likely and temperatures right around the freezing mark and again that north wind at 10 to 25 miles per hour like i said we'll have updates on uh, hailvarsity.com and you can always check on updates on my twitter accounts that's rusty wx and husker weather kick off the second half by Returning to that Minnesota game from 2019, as much as uh, maybe nobody wants to. Uh, I, I mentioned it's the game I kind of kept going back to most often as I thought about Nebraska entering 2020. I mentioned that I thought it was maybe the worst loss of the Frost era to that point. Um, 
let's talk through that a little bit. So Minnesota, as we know now, uh, went on to win 11 games last year, was in the Big Ten West race right until the very end, and finished the season on a high note with a really good bowl win. At the point Nebraska played them, though, last October, the Gophers were 5-0. and Three of those wins, the three non-conference wins, were closer than expected. And Nebraska was 4-2. and um, Had just beaten Northwestern on a game-winning field goal. Uh, as I mentioned, I think, the week of the Northwestern game. That game really was when my mind changed on, on the 2019 season a little bit. And then to see what Minnesota was able to do in a night game in Minneapolis the following week really made me feel like something was off with with Nebraska football in in 2019. So it was a key two-week stretch. As DiCaprio Boodle mentioned uh, at the top of the show, he thought it was a turning point for the season. And it was such a frustrating way to lose. I mean, Minnesota just did whatever they wanted in the run game against Nebraska. It, it was a really physical loss for, for the Huskers. I also felt it was kind of a conceptual loss. Uh, Minnesota's game plan was better. Like they just, they executed it to near perfection and, and really manhandled Nebraska in a way that maybe wasn't even fully shown by, by the 34 to seven scoreline. Uh, Frost was pretty open in that press conference following the game because I think the the frustration was was so great at that point. Uh, if you remember, that was the the game that produced the hoodie comment, uh, which is one in retrospect y- you might want to have back um, if the sentiment is is true. Maybe the delivery could have been a little bit different because that's one that kept popping up. But Frost essentially saying you know, kind of questioning his team's toughness um, based on what they wore out to to warm-ups, which always struck me as a little bit strange, um, even if it was coming from a, a place of truth. He also mentioned, and this is what I really kept coming back to over the spring and summer months, just the lack of consistency in the handoff run game. At that point, Nebraska was really, really leaning on its quarterbacks to produce much on the ground. And here we are more than a year later. And I don't know how much of that has changed. Um, I thought the ceiling was high for the offensive line this year, and it hasn't quite gotten as close to that as I, as I thought it would. Uh, the running or the quarterback carries are up over what they were for Nebraska a year ago. So there's still some, it, the run game as a whole is, is a work in progress. And I know Mills finished the season relatively strong last year, but until this, the handoff run game specifically, like the quarterback run is always going to be part of it. But until this handoff run game kind of gets back to the 2018 levels we saw from Nebraska with, with Divina Zigbo carrying the ball really, really well over the back half of that season, it's going to be hard, I think, for, for Nebraska to fully turn any sort of real or even metaphorical corner uh, until they're they're able to run the ball more consistently. So that's why that Minnesota game keeps coming back to me because here we are 14 months on and it feels like that still remains very much a work in progress, which surprises me a little bit. Nebraska does have an opportunity to sort of wipe away some of the bad feelings from just how it lost to the Gophers in 2019 this time out. How do the Huskers do that? Here are the the three keys that I've identified going into this game. Uh, Last week was pretty good in terms of a couple of thresholds that that we talked about on this show last week. Um, Mentioned keeping Purdue's passing down success rate down. Um, The Huskers did that, hit the, I think it was 30% threshold. And it looked that way. And then Nebraska on standard downs offensively was able to maintain a super high level, which you could have expected based on where Purdue had been. So that game really played out to form. Uh, the third third key I talked about last week was score in the fourth quarter. Nebraska got a field goal. It still hasn't scored a touchdown in the fourth quarter, which which remains strange. But hey, there's one game left this season to uh, to break that touchdownless streak. I guess, in, in the fourth quarters. In this one, um, in the way that Mohamed Ibrahim 
let off the the players to watch, he really is is going to to lead off the the first key here. Um, but we're going to get a little bit more specific. Number one on my list for this game is Nebraska has to get ready to stop the run, which is true overall, but it's particularly true on first downs. This this Minnesota offense is is interesting. Um, they're running the ball seventy two percent of the time on first down which is the highest rate in, in the Big Ten. They also have the league's worst team passer rating on that down. So you have a pretty good sense of, of what you're going to see as a defense from, from Minnesota on, on the first down. Uh, they're going to give it to Ibrahim. Uh, it's going to work a lot because, because he's really good, and, and Nebraska needs to be geared up to, to deal with that um, because it's just – it's such a stark run pass differential on first down from from what it is later in series that y- you kind of can't miss it. You, you can't ignore it, certainly. If Minnesota is able to, to have that rushing success that really it's had against most teams this year on first down, then the whole playbook opens up, that, that run pass percentage comes down to closer to the national average, which is about 55% run on second and third down. Uh, the whole playbook really opens up to them if they're able to have a successful play on on first down, which is football in general, but with some of the limitations the, the Gophers have right now, uh, it really becomes underscored. But this is, this is still a dangerous off- offense. Even with Bateman kind of in and out, the, the passing numbers have, have remained relatively strong. I guess the biggest thing about it is efficiency. Um, with with such a heavy run rate, it can be tough to to be a team that's on schedule all the time. But but Minnesota's passing that test with, with flying colors. They rank 18th in, nationally in overall success rate, 16th in success rate on rushing plays, and, and 31st in, in passing play success rate. That's all pretty good. In fact, you can already kind of feel, or at least I can, the a little bit of the national narrative forming around, around the Gophers as we start to look towards 2021. P.J. Fleck is, of course, a, a polarizing personality. And here, sitting at two and four, having, or two and three, excuse me, having had to have missed two games. Um, there's just been questions circling around Minnesota with that part of the equation. But also coming in, you know, the big picture question was, okay, you hopped up to 11-2, and two, really great st- season, really strong. What can you do to follow it up? And this year's not going to look like a particularly strong follow-up to, to that historic season the Gophers had in 2019. But... I would be a little bit careful with that, with those efficiency numbers that I mentioned. And that is the the sustainable part of football. Through all of the challenges the Gophers have faced in 2020, to remain that efficient on offense, um, I guess the best way to put it is I, I get a strong 2019 Northwestern vibe from, from the Gophers. We knew coming in, that the defense had to replace a lot and was probably due for a step back. Um, but the offense, it's, I don't know if I'd call it elite. Um, it's almost elite in terms of efficiency. And, and that's usually a good sign. So Minnesota is a team I already have my eye on as being perhaps a little undervalued uh, going into 2021 because people are going to be like, you won 11 games and then you went 500 or worse the following year. So what really is Minnesota football? I wouldn't go that far quite yet. Big questions to answer defensively, which we're going to get to next, but um, a lot of good things on on offense for the Gophers. And of course, a lot of the 2021 kind of projections, uh, narrative, etc. cetera, will depend a lot on exactly who's coming back and, and who isn't. But there's, there's, there's enough to like here for Minnesota. If you want a kind of specific threshold for this key to the game, the Gophers are averaging 4.72 yards per carry on first down. If Nebraska can keep that closer to four. I think it's, it's, it's going to be a good sign that the defense is playing pretty well. 
key number two for this game is Nebraska itself ready to grind it out on the ground. I went back and forth on this one a little bit. Um, for as good as Minnesota's offense is uh, in terms of staying on schedule, the defense is, well, not even arguably, it, the defense is worse at, at keeping teams off schedule. There's only 127 teams playing this this season, and the Gophers rank 126th in success rate, 125th against the rush, and 127th against the pass. All of those success rates are above 52% when you're looking at averages that are usually around 42. So it's a it's a marked difference. Um, it's been a big struggle. Teams just go up and down the field on on Minnesota, and they don't even necessarily need big plays to do it, um, though the Gophers are, are giving those up at a pretty alarming clip too. I mentioned, you know, you could have projected uh, a step back for this defense just with what they had to replace. I think seven of their top eight tacklers from 2019 were gone, but th- this goes this goes something beyond that. Nebraska should be able to to move the ball. Um, every other team that's played the Gophers so far has kind of done it at will. And this Nebraska offense, well, still dealing with some some limitations has looked pretty good of late. Um, Adrian Martinez has been great the past two weeks. Uh, You've seen a little bit more from the passing game. I went with the run because I still think, well, partly due to the potential for just a cold game, there might be some some wet weather possibly on on Saturday. And you you get this late in December, guys, even if they're available, are a little bit banged up, even in a shortened season. And it just... It, it all kind of points towards the run game. I mentioned Mills as, as a player to watch, but whoever's in it running back for Nebraska should be able to to find some room to run with the, the numbers that Minnesota has put up defensively so far this year. Uh, if you want a number to hit here, I would, um, I'll be tracking during the game Nebraska's rushing success rate. They enter the game 21st in that category. So pretty good at at 48.2% based on where Minnesota has been. I'd actually put the number to hit at about 50%. Uh, The two games in which the Gophers defense was under that Illinois and Purdue were both wins. Uh, The the tricky thing here is Nebraska has, has been over that threshold three times this season and it lost all three. Uh, Those games were Ohio state, Northwestern and Iowa. But I would say and go beyond the the results. And those are three of the better games that Nebraska has played. Uh, and it goes back a little bit to what I was talking about with what the 2019 Minnesota-Nebraska game revealed. Uh, this offense operates pretty well when it is able to run the football, when it's able to do all of the things that it's capable of but also wants to do in the run game. Passing the passing numbers tend to look better in those games too. Northwestern, I guess, from this year being the exception, but Nebraska was was efficient in passing the football against Ohio State and, and the Iowa game, it was able to do some damage that way as well. So similar to to what Minnesota hopes to do when it has the ball, just being able to consistently gain ground on the ground really opens up the playbook. It opens up all of your play action, all of the fun and fancy stuff that Scott Frost and Matt Lubick like to and are capable of doing. So keep an eye on that, on Nebraska's run game. Um, you can well keep an eye on it both ways uh, because I think it's going to be how this game is defined. Final key for this game is 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 a pretty big one. What happens when Minnesota crosses the 50-yard line? They're going to, um, like I said, they're extremely efficient. Um, the offense overall, having gone back and watched a couple of earlier Minnesota games this week in the lead up to this game, and then just taken you know kind of the usual deep stats dive that I do each week uh, for for Nebraska's upcoming opponents. It's honestly a, a pretty impressive impressive group, given given all of the noise, the things that could have gotten in the way this year. But one of the most impressive numbers for for Minnesota 
is just its ability to finish drives, which we know has been a struggle for Nebraska. Gophers rank 12th in points per trip inside the 40. They're they're averaging 4.7, so up almost around the five point mark, which is extraordinarily good. It comes with a little bit of a caveat here. Um, so this key is really kind of a two-fold one for me. I think some of the Gophers, uh, I mean, don't take any credit away from them for being able to finish drives with touchdowns. Like that's what you want. That's the, that's the whole game, um, is, is to score as as many points as possible, obviously, but special teams haven't been great for, for Minnesota. Uh, they rank last in the big 10 at 35.5 yards per punt. So when you get in those situations where maybe it's a borderline field goal or, you know, maybe you're approaching the 50 yard line and it's a fourth and short fourth and two, fourth and three, whatever it is. Uh, there's a little bit of more impetus for, for the Gophers to go for it. Uh, just with how poorly they're punting. They've also, and this ties in too, only attempted three field goals this year, made two of three, but the one miss, uh, was, was kind of key to the, that loss against Maryland. Uh, the fact that they've only attempted three, I think also tells you a little bit about their confidence in the kicking game at this point. So the Huskers really need to force that issue on Saturday. They need to be able to test the Minnesota kicking game by getting stop, stops on, on their half of the field. Uh, that's a defensive thing. Also plays in with special teams, which, which was a, a, big, a big part of, of last Saturday's win at Purdue. Um, Nebraska has made some gains in, in specific areas as far as special teams go. It's still, I don't think, where they want it uh, in, the, in the SP plus rankings, which, you know, in addition to the overall ranking we talk about uh, in the first half each week, they also, it also breaks things out by offense, defense, and special teams. Nebraska is still a net negative uh, in, in special teams, but two of the Big Ten teams that have been worse in that rating the last couple of weeks are Purdue, which we saw that that block punt on the first series set Nebraska up at the one yard line uh, with an easy touchdown to jump out to a 7-0 lead. Huskers gave away a little bit of of the special teams advantage. I think they engineered early on in that game had their own punt blocked, of course, but still you went into that one thinking Nebraska doesn't, have, not doesn't, Nebraska hasn't had a special teams edge on a ton of teams uh, of late. Last week's game against Purdue is one where you could have said, yeah, they might be a little bit better. This is another one of those. Um, Minnesota's special teams unit has been an adventure to, to, to put it kindly so far in 2020. And that's that's one of those things that you might chalk up a little bit to just the nature of this season. Um Shorten practice times, uh, no spring football, not a traditional fall camp, chaos everywhere. One of the things that's, that's easy to get left behind is the detail-driven work of special teams. And we really saw that I, I, kind of across the board in the first couple of weeks of the football season, too. Special teams were were a total mess for, for most teams. So maybe it's nothing long-term, but we're not worried about long-term for now. We're only worried about Saturday. Minnesota is going to move the football. It's going to reach Nebraska's territory. Um, it's it's done that really well uh, against most teams. And when it gets there, it tends to to score six, not three. Nebraska needs to find a way to flip that equation, uh, force those field goals, make Minnesota try them. It's true of any game, but with the way this one sets up, I think it will take on. It'll be under the spotlight a little bit. That'll conclude the final regular season episode of the I-80 Preview podcast for 2020. Um, went quick, which I guess you could have expected, given a shortened schedule, but it felt even a little bit faster than that at times. Thanks, as always, for listening. Um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback on the show, you can reach, a, you can reach me at I-80 at HaleVarsity.com or on Twitter at Brandon L. Vogel. Uh, always love to chat some football there and uh, we'll see what happens after that plan is still for the big 10 to play on the weekend of December 19th, Nebraska's bowl hopes aren't totally dashed. I don't think um, maybe not even partially dashed because 
beyond the top four in the Big Ten, you kind of got a group of teams who are all trying to uh, sort each other, sort themselves out from the others. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with those those bowl selections. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many bowls are, are left standing as some of the cancellations there start to mount up. But hopefully we'll have a couple more, a couple more chances to do this before the year is out. And uh, we'll talk to you then. Hoda Media Production.